Hey yo, what's up everybody? Good day to you all ladies and gents. Welcome back to Matrix Investing, the number one YouTube channel that is dedicated towards giving you education based on investing in capital markets. Now in this video, we're going to look at the asset classes that are found in the capital markets, knowing what shares are, the types of shares, as well as the benefits and challenges an investor could get when owning these type of shares. Now if this video has been by all means helpful to you, please help us out by liking this video, hit that like button, um, Subscribe to our channel if you haven't, please do so, help us out there. And also hitting that notification bell so that YouTube can notify you, can alert you each time we get to upload a video onto this platform. Now without said, without said, let's get down to business. So here we're going to look at the type of asset classes that are found in the capital markets. Now there are technically two main types, two main types of asset classes that are found in the capital markets, um, especially the one in Tanzania, of which are shares and bonds. Now, if um, if you've checked our previous video, where we were mostly talking about capital markets, um, we emphasize that most organizations that get into these capital markets with the aim of um, raising funds, getting capital from investors, they have two main ways of which they could raise those funds. One of them being issuing of shares, of which shares are basically units of ownership. Um, investors get to uh, invest cash in exchange for ownership into that company. And the second alternative was bonds, of which bonds is basically um, organizations going up to investors, borrowing their money and for an agreed specific period of time. And within that time range of which they're going to use that borrowed money, they're going to get to pay investors um, interest rates depending on the agreed rates that they that have been allocated there and once that time frame is done they get to pay they have to pay back the investors what they originally borrowed from them so then um moving on to what shares are shares are basically units of ownership in companies basically companies offer shares to investors in exchange for capital contributed by investors usually in the form of cash so then speaking in normal sense um when, when it comes to starting up a business or let's say um, expanding a business, there's usually capital that is concerned over there. You Like investors, appropriators have to inject um, capital into that business for it to start, for it to kickstart or for it to expand. So then um, moving on to the concept of shares, um, there, so then, like, when we move on to the transactions, companies come into the capital markets um, looking for um, fundraising, fundraising from investors. So then the transaction that happens there is um, a company gives out ownership through shares of these, of which these um, shares are divided into units. And out of these units, an investor gets to buy these shares per unit. So then once an investor... Um, receives those uh, once an investor receives those shares those units of shares an investor then has to pay out uh, cash it has to pay out capital usually money worth or money itself but in most cases it's usually money so then an investor has to give out an equivalent an accepted equivalent monetary value of the sh unit of shares that this investor has attained so then Ownership of these shares are usually confirmed by the issuing of stock certificates which are created under the authorization and supervision of the Dar es Salaam Stock Exchange in contextity to the Tanzanian stock market. So then um, moving on to seeing the example of what a stock certificate looks like. So then here's an example of what a stock certificate looks like. Um, you can see right here it has particular details such as your name and address, the name and address of a registered holder. There is the CDS account number. Basically, a CDS account number is an investment account that um, shows you the quantity of shares you own in several different companies as well as um, the capital you've invested in bonds. So then there is date. Uh, date is as far as when you this certificate has been made there is issue of security so then issue of security is basically the company of which you've invested in and then there's the number and description of security deposited so then that typically shows you the number of shares you have and the type of shares that they are so then um moving on to the types of shares 
There are basically two types of shares. There are two main types of shares of which are ordinary or common shares, and then there's preference shares. So then starting with ordinary shares. So then ordinary shares are shares that basically represent ownership in a certain business. They're simply ownership stocks. I'll just call them ownership shares, actually. Why? Because an investor who gets to buy shares in a company and ends up having to buy ordinary shares pretty, pretty much gets to acquire rights of ownership in that particular business. And such rights could include um, voting and electing the board of directors that gets to run their business on the shareholders' behalf. They get to... Um, they get to approve the amount of money of which they could get paid as dividends. They get to approve principles and guidelines that are supposed to run the company. And they have the right to know what the business is going through. They have the right to know measures that are taken to improve the performance of the business and et cetera. So all these are basically rights an owner, an owner of a business has. So then by acquiring and by owning ordinary shares, you get to have these sort of rights. You get to make decisions that impact the well-being of a particular business. So then reading on, owners of such shares usually possess the power to elect the board of directors, which gets to look after the company on their behalf, as well as electing principles and guidelines that will be applied in running the day-to-day -day activities of the business. So then these investors or then ordinary shares are basically shares that um, are, they're more of ownership-wise concerned. Um, you get to make decisions, and all these happen through annual general meetings. And annual general meetings are basically meetings where the shareholders meet up with the board of directors to discuss the well-being of the business, to discuss future prospects of the business, um, what they should get paid as dividends. Um, they get to look at the financial situation of the business and so many other aspects that are related to that particular business. So then in case of payments, as far as payments are concerned, ordinary shareholders get paid last after bondholders, preference shareholders, and if the business were to go bankrupt and every possession of the business were to be sold to pay off investors and lenders, then common shares, shareholders will get paid last after the bondholders and shareholders. So then the downside of owning ordinary shares are that basically if this company of which an investor owns ordinary shares if this company how if this company does happen to have bonds you know a company can get to issue both shares and bonds so then if this company gets to um give out bonds and if this company were to give out both preferred shares and ordinary shares, then as far as payments are concerned, the first person in line to get payments are bondholders and they get paid through interest because they've lent the money. So then like lenders first, then preference shareholders, preference shareholders get paid up second and then the person, the shareholders in the bottom line are the ordinary shareholders. And this also applies in case of bankruptcy. So then if a business were to go bankrupt, um, all the assets would have to be liquidated, all the assets would have to be sold at market value, and the cash that, the cash that is acquired from selling, the cash that is then, then collected, um, bondholders get paid first, the capital they've invested, um, preference, share, preference shareholders second, and lastly, common shareholders. So then the downside to all this is that in case the finance dry, like in, in case the cash dries out, um, as far as dividends are concerned, ordinary shareholders might not get paid dividends. But then in case of bankruptcy, in case all of uh, bondholders get paid, all preference shareholders get paid, and let's say the finance the finances are more likely to cut dry um, by the time it gets to the ordinary shareholders. So then they might miss out on dividend payments. And in case of bankruptcy, they might not get um, their capital invested. Like they might not get all of it or they might not get it at all. So then that's the flip side of owning ordinary shares. So then looking at what preference shares are. So preference shares are basically shares that represent prioritized payments in a business. No wonder they're called preference shares because they get paid first in line before ordinary shareholders. So then owners of such shares are prioritized with payments of dividends before ordinary shareholders, but then after bondholders get paid their interest. 
lenders first. Also, in the case of bankruptcy, um, shareholders are paid back their capital before ordinary shareholders, but after bondholders get paid their capital first. So then it's bondholders first in line, then preferred shareholders, then last but not least, the ordinary shareholders. Now, the, down, the downside to owning such preference shares is that um, such shareholders got no right to vote for the board of directors. They got no right to vote for the leaders who get to run this company on their behalf, but then they don't have rights to vote for uh, guidelines and principles that include the day-to-day company that will affect the day-to-day business activities of the company. So then these guys, um, sure they get paid their cash first, sure they're first in line to get paid, but then these guys, as far as decision making is concerned, they're at the bottom of the food chain, I mean the investing chain, because, well, yeah, they do not have any right whatsoever to elect the leaders that get to run or get to, like, manage the company on their behalf. So then, like, that's pretty sad, man. But, man, I guess we move. So let's check out the advantages of owning shares. Advantage number one of getting to own shares is that you get the privilege of getting paid dividends. So what are dividends? Dividends are basically the amount of money that is paid to shareholders as a result of owning shares in that particular company. Well, that is right. For each and every single share you own in a company, you get paid. You get paid for owning even a share in a company. So then, like, that's pretty lit. That's one of the advantages you get for owning shares. Um, Dividend payments, however, and numbers of shares held in the company are directly proportional to each other. So then that typically means the more shares you own in a particular company, the more dividends you get to receive. However, the less the shares you own in a company, the less the money that you get to receive as dividends. And um, such payments vary from company to company. Like, you could own an insurance company that gets to pay a certain amount of money as dividends. You get to own, let's say, a company that is in the airline industry, but then pays a different amount of money as dividends. So let's say insurance are to pay you five shillings per share. If you move on to the airline industry, they would probably pay you two shillings per share. If you are to invest in telecommunications, they would pay you 15 shillings per share. So then like the dividend payments in constant, they vary between company and company. They vary between sectors and sectors. So then that's so then that's basically everything about dividends. So then let's check out an example for each and every single share held by an investor. He or she gets paid five shillings. So then just think about it. For every one share, you get paid five shillings. Now imagine if this shareholder had a thousand shares. That shareholder would get paid five thousand shillings. Imagine if this shareholder had a million shares in that company. Then this shareholder would be entitled to getting five million shillings so then basically the amount of money you get paid as dividends um is like in line it's directly proportional to the number of shares you have so then investors um make sure you own as many shares as possible in great companies so then you get to get a lot of money as far as dividends are concerned now let's not forget there is also that um tax cut that is five percent on dividend payments so then if you're entitled to get five million you don't forget to factor in five percent or five million which is two fifty thousand so then that's five million minus two hundred and fifty thousand so then you get to receive four million seven hundred and fifty thousand g taxes anyways but then five five percent is very insignificant compared to the 95% you get to work out with. I mean, Tanzania is a pretty great country. Like, you won't, you go to other countries, you'd probably get paid, you'd probably get taxed more on your dividend payments. Like, 5% is very graceful. Now, looking at capital appreciation. Now, these are profits earned on capital invested by an investor after buying shares at a low price and selling them at a high price. Now, example. An investor buys 500 shares from the company Tapepa and bought them for a market price of 100 shillings. So then that's 50,000 shillings invested. And let's say this investor were to hold 
on to these 500 shares and the share prices because the company is doing good and because every like more and more investors want to cash into the same company the prices double to 200 so then technically this investor who owned 500 shares um invested 50,000 shillings into this company um the same 500 shares now have a valuation of a hundred thousand shillings because the market price jumped to 200 so then um you can see that uh the original capital invested was 50,000 so then this investor right here just got profit just got 50,000 shillings worth of capital gain so then basically if this investor decided to sell his shares he or she would walk out with 50,000 shillings now the bright the, the the bright side about um capital appreciation is that if you're to sell shares um if you're to sell shares and you're to get a gain on the capital like with the capital appreciation you do not get taxed anything it's zero percent so then you get to walk out with that for this example you get to walk out with that fifty thousand shillings no one's gonna touch you oh wait i just remembered there's brokerage cost to be included that's like 2.06 percent so then um basically uh if it's gonna be a hundred thousand times 0 0.0206 0 0.0206 so then out of a hundred thousand you just have to uh, worry about 2060 and the rest of the money is yours so then that's that folks so then yeah let's move on to the third advantage which is ownership of business so as mentioned earlier shares are a unit of ownership in a particular business this means that if you own a business that this means that you own a business for every single share you possess in a company now the ownership is useful when an investor is trying to make decisions in the company such as appointing the board of directors the more the shares one has in a company in comparison to the total number of shares owned in the company the greater the ownership and the influence an investor has in the company well let's not forget this is um shout out to um ordinary shares because like it's all about ownership and decision making and influence but then also let's not forget a very important concept that is um the amount of ownership equals to the amount of influence you have in the business and the amount of ownership goes down to the number of shares you have in a company so then the more the cash you've invested the more the shares you have in a company means that the more the ownership and the more the control you have over the company and that means that when it comes to decision making voting time and your general meetings if you have a very huge ownership in the company then your decisions are taken seriously like your decisions have got more weight than if you had insignificant or if you had less number of shares in that particular company so then um giving you an example an investor owning 1000 tanga cement shares out of 15 thousand shares gets to own the company by 6.6 percent this is an assumption guys tanga cement doesn't literally have 15,000 shares there's probably more than that so then anyways let's digest this example so um this investor owns a thousand shares in tanga cement and the total number of shares that tanga cement had issued to the stock exchange was 15,000 shares so we just have to divide that um divided by 15,000 shares so then that's 0 0.06666 to the end of time um let's change that into percentage and that will be 6.666 basically 6.6 percent so then this owner lucky owner has a 6.6 percent ownership in this particular business so then um where does this ownership get to count where does it really when where is where and when is it really significant so then um in the case of an agm an annual general meeting and all investors have to sit down um do elections let's say they're about to appoint a leader and um it's a yes or no like yes let this leader um join the board of directors or no cut this leader off this leader isn't worthy so then um when it comes let's say this investor right here with a 6.6 percent ownership was in for this particular person to get appointed in the board of directors so then that's zero point i mean that's 6.6 percent 
of the entire company that has agreed upon having this investor in the particular business. Now, let's um, moving on to like general concepts. So then, if more than fifty percent of the shareholders, or if more than fifty percent of the company has agreed or disagreed towards this particular leader, towards this particular leader, either getting being appointed or not being appointed in the company. So then, if more than 50% of the ownership has decided towards one answer, then that one answer will be taken in four. So then um, out of 50%, out of 50%, let's say 51%, so then if it's like more than 50%, that majority, um, that majority's decision gets to be implemented. So then 6.6% has already said yes, towards having this person as a director. So then 44.4% of the company needs to um, stay in the same side with this 6.6% for them to have more than 51% of the decision that this person should be appointed as director. So then like um, if the for, if 44, if at least 44.4% of the business agrees along with this particular investor, then this leader should be um, appointed in the board of directors, then that person is more likely to be appointed. So then each and every single share you own counts as ownership. So then if you had one out of 15,000 shares, one out of 15,000 shares um, times 100, that's 0.006%. So then for each share you get to own, you have a 0.006% shareholding. As far as this example is concerned though, don't take it personally. Um, so then the more the shares you have, the more uh, the stakeholding you have in this business. So then your 0.0, your 0.006% is considered in um, annual general meetings. So then the more the shares you have, the more um, your decisions have got effect because they look at the stakeholding each and every single investor has in that business. So then if I had a 24% ownership in Tanga Siemens and if I were to say no, then that's 24% of the company that said no. I just need a few more investors to say no with me so that it can be at least a 51% stakeholding that says no, and the decision, therefore, the final decision becomes a no. If 24% said yes, then you need the remaining, um, what's 51 minus 24? Uh, 51 minus 24. So then you need the remaining 27% to say yes with you, at least 27%, for it to be a yes as the final answer. So then that's basically ownership in this particular business. Now, moving on to opportunity to diversify in different types of companies. The stock market comprises of different companies performing businesses in different sectors such as banking, insurance, construction, and beverages just to mention a few. An investor has the opportunity to invest in different attractive businesses from different sectors of the economy and have a chance to profit from several sectors in the economy. So then just think about it. Um, let's say you're an investor. Um, say you've always wanted to own a bank. Let's say you've always dreamed of having a bank under your name. So then through investing in shares, you can, you get to have that, like that opportunity is there. You can simply just go to the stock exchange, look for an existing bank, see as to whether that existing bank is an attractive business, if its financial performances are good, if it's doing well in its business, if it's doing well in its sector, and boom, all you have to do is invest a good amount of money into the business and therefore you are an owner of that particular business. Now, this is like pretty lit. I mean, just think about it. You get to own by investing. Um, this is unlike, I mean, you don't have to, you don't have to use the long route where you be like, oh, I have to accumulate cash and, and start a bank and, and go through like, um, several legal requirements and, um, get approvals and permits and start this and market this bank, this new bank I just started and get more and more people into, um, having, deposits into this bank and you know you don't have to go through all that blah 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 I mean all you have to do is invest and boom you're an owner 
as long as you invest, as long as you have ordinary shares, that is. So then, therefore, you get to invest in banks. You get to in, you get to own several businesses. Like I understand, I personally understand how hard it is to start a business. The day-to-day -day hustles you have to incur to in making sure a business remains lit remains amazing. So then, um, to cut all that out, let's say you've always dreamed of owning several businesses. You can basically do that through investing in shares. So then you have. Um, businesses in banking let's say you have businesses in the airline you have businesses in telecoms you have businesses in um food you have businesses in beverages and the advantage to doing to having let's say multiple businesses from multiple sectors is that say one sector were to not perform well in like as, let's say one sector were to perform poorly in the economy. Let's say it's 2020, and in 2020, let's say you had ownership in banking, you had ownership in telecoms, you had ownership in airlines. So then let's say in 2020, um, the airline business went really, really bad due to COVID-19 effects and all that stuff. The airline industry went suckish. So then as an investor, let's say you you have a stock, you own an airline business. So then, yes, okay, you will be affected um, by the downfall of that sector. But then you have banking and telecoms, which have done really, really well. Now, because these two sectors have done really, really well, um, they get to offset the losses you might have incurred uh, through owning business in the airline sector. So then if you had less dividend payments here, um, that would be offset by that would be offset by an increase in dividends in the banking and telecoms. That is, if the businesses have done very well and they've increased biz, uh, they've increased their dividend shares, I mean dividend payment. But also, let's say the share prices increase for the telecom and the banking side. So then you see, um, you've got other sectors pulling you up. That is, unlike if you went all into airlines and you bled and 2020 happened, COVID-19 blasted through the whole world, became a pandemic. So then you'd be bleeding lots of cash. You'd be like, oh, this is such a bad year for me as far as investing is concerned and all that stuff. So then the stock market is there to tell you, hey, you can own awesome, you can own businesses in several other sectors. But then it's up to you as an investor to figure out the good businesses and invest in the good businesses that will provide you great returns in the long run. So then, um, looking at advantage number five, it is a liquid asset and can provide great returns in the long run. So then liquidity refers to the ability to convert an asset to cash. So then as far as assets are concerned, um, shares are probably the easiest assets to sell and have them converted back to cash in comparison to other assets, such as real estate. So then let's say you had shares and um, you needed to sell them off. So then... They are very liquid. It is very easy for you to sell them off because like um, the stock market, as far as the stock market is concerned, it is very easy to get a buyer who wants to buy those shares. So then you get to sell those shares to that buyer. That buyer gets to own them. You get your cash paid and you're out. You're liquid. You've liquidated these stocks. That This is very easy. Like it's easy to connect a seller and a buyer. Now, however, this is more likely to happen for good businesses. Like trust me, if you have a terrible company that does terrible in sales, that does terrible in profits, that doesn't pay any dividends. If basically, basically, if this business is ugly and unattractive and isn't providing any returns to you, and by so ha and let's say by any means you might have happened to own these shares, trust me, it's not going to be easy to um, liquidate these ones because like an investor trying to buy shares is trying to buy shares into a good company. So then like if you're selling bad shares like a bad business if you're trying to cash out a bad business you might have a hard time doing so because investors most investors are more aware of good companies and companies to invest in so then you might have a hard time cashing out of of bad companies so then but regardless of that in general um selling of shares selling shares like liquidating them is much more easier. It takes a shorter time compared to other asset classes. But then, but not only that, but also stocks have a potential to give out great returns to investors' capital in terms of dividends and capital appreciation. But all this is all up to if an investor gets to pick the right business 
as in for the long run. So then if you have if you are sitting on a gold mine, that is if you have invested in the best performing businesses, you've checked out its previous financial performances, you've checked out how this company has been doing historically, you've checked out its um, current situation in the market, what the market looks like, if you've checked out um, the sector, how this sector reacts, um, if you've checked out, if you've basically understood this business and you're like, okay, this is a really nice business and I should invest in it, and you invest in a really nice business, um, stocks, I mean, owning shares has got, like, probably has the greatest potential as far as returns are concerned. Because, like, if this business is a good business, it's continuing to do good. This business continues to grow. If it continues to grow, um, the capital invested keeps on rising in value, um, both business-wise and in the, uh, in the stock exchange. The market prices will keep rising because the investors will be like, oh, my God. This is such a good company, and we also want to invest in this too. So then share prices are going to rise and rise and rise. But then also dividend payments are going to increase over time. That is, let's say this year you got paid 17 shares, I mean 17 shillings per share of dividends. Next year you're going to get paid 20. They are, that you're going to get paid 25. Like, it's going to keep on increasing in number. So then if you had originally invested 500 shares, or let, let's say 1,000 shares, this year you're going to get 17,000, next year you're going to get 20,000, there after that you're going to get 25,000. Now, this, all this is all up to a business being a good business and a business performing well. So then if you happen to have a company that performs well, then just be patient, hold on to the stock, and let compound interest, let time do its magic. So then that's basically it. So... Let's check out the disadvantages, the challenges, sorry, the challenges an investor could probably get as far as owning shares are concerned. So challenge number one is uncertain dividend payments. So then we need to understand that a company has got a choice as to whether or not it should pay dividends. That's number one. Two, as well as how much it should pay depending on its financial situation. So basically, if a business is like, okay, fine, we're going to pay you dividends, it gets to choose, like you all get to decide as to whether how much should be paid as a dividend per share. Now, this is all based on a board of directors recommendation. The board is like, okay, so then um, due to the financial situation we have, I think we should pay you guys, let's say, seven shillings per share. And then basically you guys have to reject or not. So then that's how it works. So then when a business decides to prioritize growth of the business, it could either pay very little or no dividend at all. And this also happens when a business is going through tough financial times and it needs all the money it can, ha it can get to survive. At this point, a business could either cut down or cut off completely its dividend payment. So then um, investors, especially investors who've got very little stakeholding into the business, um, uncertain dividend payments. What this basically means is that a company can decide as to whether or not you get paid dividends. Now, it's not a company, actually. The majority shareholders, like the shareholders who've got a huge stake in this company because they have the greatest influence, if they say, hmm, maybe this business needs to grow, um, it needs to grow, so then maybe we should pay up um, very little as dividends. So then if they agree with the directors that um, very little should be paid, you as a minor investor, you'd be like, oh, well, I guess I'll have to go with that flow. And also, if a business is going through tough financial times, like if a business is trying to survive, you know, um, it's making losses, costs are rising. Um, basically, for a business, that is no time at all to think of dividend payments because a business is trying to survive. Like, you're trying to survive, trying to reduce as many costs as possible, trying to make as much money as possible. And here, investors are saying, like, hey, please pay us dividend money. Um, businesses are more likely not to pay dividends through tough financial times. So then basically if you've invested in a company that is going through tough times and doesn't, so you basically have uncertainty as far as dividend payments are concerned. You could either p get paid very little or you couldn't get paid any dividend at all. So you'd be like, yikes, no dividend payments. But then also if a business is like hungry for growth, like um, growth, it wants to increase its operations, it wants to um, scale up, it wants to open branches, it wants to diversify to new markets, it's going to need as much money as possible. And as far as as much money as possible, that includes reinvesting 
as much profit as possible. Now remember, the dividend payments investors get paid um, derived from the um, accumulated profits that have been earned by the company throughout the years of its operations. So then if a business feels like growing, if a business feels like expanding, it will probably pay you very little amount of money. Like out of all the profits they've earned, they'll probably pay you a little cut or they'll be like, you know what, sorry y'all, we gotta grow first. So then they'll cut, they'll cut off dividend payments and focus on growing. So then an investor, especially a minor one, is very, very uncertain of the dividend payments they'll get. Number two, decline in share prices. An investor might have bought shares at a certain micro market price with the expectation of selling them when the prices are higher. However, one might not meet such expectations as share prices would plunge, hence causing a loss on capital invested if the investor is desperate to sell the shares at that particular price. So then let's say... um for whatsoever reason you decided to cash into a company with the expectation that the company is going to jump in share price and then you're going to sell at that particular share price and boom, cash out with a profit. So then let's say um, you had that in mind. But then due to various reasons such as maybe the company, the time you're buying into the company, the company therefore goes to tough, uh, tough times, like tough financial times, or the time you cash in, um, there's lots of people who want to cash out. So then you'll be like, um, you just sit there, wait, and then you'd be like, why aren't share prices ri rising? Like, um, so many people want to sell their shares. You just happen to buy in. And um, basically, the reason to why share prices decline is when a lot of investors want to sell out their shares, and there's very few investors who want to cash in shares. Like, when the demand is less than the supply. So then, if you might have, if you have bought into the shares of a certain company under this scenario, you will eventually realize that share prices are plunging because there's so much supply, lots of people want to cash out, and you just happen to cash in thinking that you'll cash out with a profit, and well, that didn't happen, I'm sorry, and then you get desperate, you're like, there's no way this thing's going to climb back up maybe due to your analysis or whatsoever reason you have in mind. So then you get to sell your shares at a lower price than what you got them for. So then that's a loss and you're like, oh, I just made a loss on my investment. Oh, that that, that kind of hurt. So then like, yeah. So then that's another challenge that's there when it, as far as in like owning shares are concerned. Um, this is challenge number three is limited ownership. Unlike starting a business or owning other assets such as Real estate and bonds where an investor has 100% ownership, full control. Investing in shares can limit an investor to the ownership one has in the business. This is mostly the case for small investors as they would have a less number of shares in a company, meaning that their say or decision will have less influence and impact in the company. So that's right. Um, particularly when investing in the stock market in shares, investing in businesses that are publicly listed in the stock market, um, you don't have a 100% ownership or control. There are other investors there too. There are probably big dogs. By big dogs, I mean um, wealthy dudes who've invested millions and billions of shillings into um, companies that are listed in the stock exchange and therefore have like 5%, um, 6% ownership. Trust me, a 5 or 6% ownership in a public limited company is a big deal. Believe me. A 0.51% ownership in a company itself could set you out. That could set you up for life. Depend like if you've cashed in a good company and that company, yeah, like if you've cashed in a good company. So then if you're a minor investor, you'd be like, ah, oh, you just have a few hundred shares or a few thousand shares. Um, you have, let's say, 10,000 shares, a few 10,000 shares. Like, this is very limited, like, as far as annual general meetings are concerned, as far as decision making are concerned, sure, um, your vote counts, but then it has very little in impact. Unless lots of your, unless lots of small investors, um, happen to have the same decision and all that small ends up, um, overpowering the huge, um, stakeholding interest, then that's when it counts. But then, Personally, as a minor investor, if you're to say no and the majority says yes and the big dogs were to say yes, your your decision, I'm sorry, your decisions are not, not going to be taken any seriously. So then that's the 
flip side, that's the challenge that an investor could get, especially a minor one, when it comes to owning shares. Moving on to the last challenge that is, it requires a lot of research. So then, to get the best possible returns when choosing to invest in shares, one must do intense research and analysis upon multiple businesses for the investor to realize which business suits for investment. Now, this becomes a problem if an investor has not learned how to perform research as they could most likely make unwise investment decisions. Therefore, an investor must learn to perform research, put in hours of work, for he or she to find a good company worthy of investing. So then um, you will have, you you feel like, okay, now I'm ready. I want to invest into, I have cash. I want to invest in a company that is good, that will provide me great returns in the future. So then you have a list of companies in the stock exchange. So then you have to like analyze these companies. You have to break through, um, filter the good ones from the bad ones. And out of those good ones, you're going to have to look for the best of the best. You don't have to invest in all the good ones. You just have to best invest in the best three, the best two. The, the, like, it's the few that literally, it's the few that really set you up for life as far as wealth and as far as returns are concerned. So then for you to get the best three, the best two, the best two one, you will have to, like, the, like if out of that list, the narrower you go, like the the narrower you get to the best of the best um, investments, the more and more research, the more and more analysis you're going to have to put in. Like filtering the good investments from the bad ones won't be very hard. Like you can just filter them. Now, out of those good investments, you're going to have to find the best ones. Now, finding the best ones might require you to put in even more effort. You're going to have to look at even more factors. You're going to have to consider more metrics. You're going to have to consider the, you're going to have to consider things such as um, the the role of that business in that sector. You're going to have to look at its performances, um, comparing compare it to other competitors. You're going to have to see if it really has a leading market share. You're going to have to look at its financial side. Is it making good profits in relation to capital? Is it uh, good at controlling its expenses? So then there's tons of things you're going to have to look at for you to figure out that, yes, this is the best of the best investments and I will invest in these ones, and you will full confidently say that this one will set me up for life. So then for you to do that, you need to have a lot of knowledge, and you need to do a lot of research. Now, luckily for Matrix, Matrix investing, um, as far like if you keep on consuming our content, we'll get to the part where we get to figure out what you need to do or what you need to have for you to perform good research. So then that could be a challenge for an investor who has no idea where to start as far as research is concerned because an investor right there would probably make, most likely make unwise decisions that would like scar the investor. So then that's that. So then with that said everybody, um, thank you so, so much for watching this video. If this video has been very helpful this, if this video has been of great use to you hey, please, 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 please smash that like button um that is a way of letting us know that you really understood this video subscribe if you haven't please do so hit that subscribe button like hit it real hard make sure it's like gone like from subscribe red to subscribe in black and then hit that notification bell so that youtube can notify you each time we get to upload new videos to youtube so then if you also have questions i mean if you're on other social media platforms that is instagram facebook and twitter you can check us out there at matrix investing we try and make sure that we create content on a day-to-day -day basis that are all related to the capital market shares and bonds that are available in tanzania so then check us out to instagram check us out to facebook check us out to twitter but then if you also have a personal question related to capital markets i'm investing in stocks and bonds you can DM us, we just a DM away, we'll be happy to answer, we'll be happy to reply, so then thank you so, so, so much, and have a great day.